Uh, here's what we got. You may have known, and I don't remember if I've ever covered this before in great detail, my constant battle with the rear brake on this Z1R. The rear brake, the rear brake master in particular. This thing has been painted like four times because of it being, you know, because it leaks, you know, it, not leaks, it leaked, I should say, past tense, particularly around this O-ring that where this reservoir seats in. Now I've solved that by obtaining uh, an O-ring, well actually a set of two, they only, the guy only sells them in pairs, they're unobtainium elsewhere. Yeah, anyway, so, uh, you know, I, I've had so many problems with this thing and I've been trying to get it rectified and it, it works, the brake works, it stops. The trouble is, it's leaking again, but not from here. It's leaking from the central bore where the piston is. Now I replaced that seal but I found a rubber um, part that is exactly the same. It was a Honda one that fit a 5 8 bore and it worked perfect. Now I did have trouble getting this bled up and the reason why is, and the reason why it's leaking now is because the inside of this bore is all corroded. I did the best I could to hone it out. You know, it worked, but it's leaking. And where it's leaking, of course, is right down the rod here. So, you know, I never get to use this phrase in a sentence. So this is gonna be fun. It's dripping out the shaft. <laughs> now, how many times can you actually use that without, you know, somebody thinking you're a pervert? But it's dripping along the shaft. Now, normally drips on my shaft, I don't really mind them too much. In this case, I mind them a great deal. Brake fluid at the end, and there's a little bit of a puddle on the floor. And, you know, it's oozing past the seal because of the condition of the inside of that board. I can also show you this dust boot that uh, I did replace, and now it's getting pretty trash from all this brake fluid. But if you kind of look down in there, you can see it's all wet, and that's because, of course, it's full of fluid. So this is kind of capturing some of it and it's hanging out in there for a while and it finally makes its way down. What we're going to do about this, I'm not 100% sure, but I think the first thing we definitely, definitely, definitely need to do right now is to pull the rear master, take it apart, and then we'll go over some options. I do have kind of a radical idea. All right, folks, here's the rear master out on the bench. Well, anyway, I'm gonna go ahead and take this little C-clip out or on the bottom, actually it's more of a spring clip, but we're gonna get this spring clip out. That's, this is a pretty simple master cylinder, it really is, in regards to assembly or disassembly or what have you. And you have your piston. And again, uh, this is a special piston, but again, I, I replaced this rubber. There's not a damn thing wrong with this rubber and it's the right size. This is a 5 8 diameter piston. Uh, it's, you can tell that because of the way it is. And the fact that it says 5 8 right there, that doesn't hurt. This, um, I think this was new too, so this isn't a problem as well. Remember, this thing is draining fluid this way. It's running down past this seal. And I know the seal is seating because it was working fine. I believe it's the bore that's given us a problem because the inside of this uh, bore is pretty chewed up. What I'm gonna do is kind of lay this piston up against here so you have a relative uh, you know, relationship of where this thing sits in the bore, which is important. And so remember there's a sp uh, spring clip in that groove right there and then there's a washer, so it sits about right there. Essentially about right there is where this thing is living until it you know, gets actuated by the rear brake uh, lever. Uh, you got to keep that in mind because when we see the inside of this bore, you'll get an idea of what the problem is. You can kind of see the line like grooves uh, eroded into it. That's a reflection on the right there, but there are some some serious um, issues with these this bore from corrosion. And really one one really bad one is right in that area. You see it right there, all right? And that's about the same location as where that piston is sitting, or the rubber that is, when, um, when it's in that relaxed position before it actually provides pressure, uh, which probably explains why it doesn't fail when you put pressure on it, because it gets into a more clean area. So again, th this is pretty trashed. And I knew that before, I was trying to wing it and see what would happen, but you know, no bueno. The first option obviously would be to replace this, but this is really on Obtanium. 
I've spent a considerable amount of time online trying to find a replacement for this. Um, there are a couple on Flea Bay right now uh, that are in worse shape than this is. Uh, you can tell that because, I mean, the bottom where this piston it sits, which is still installed on some of them, is so corroded, looks like it's been sitting next to the Titanic. That doesn't matter. What matters is what we're gonna do about this. So replacement of the entire master cylinder is probably not gonna happen. Now, yeah, I could probably, I could definitely, definitely, definitely. put a search, um, you know, a continuing search online through Fleabay, and if one popped up that was better, it might take, you know, two weeks, two months, two years, uh, we could get uh, one to um, you know replace this one, but um, and there are other ones that that fit this as far as I can tell, uh, although they don't bear the same part number. Um, like for the um, 79 LTD 1000, it looks to be the same, but there are subtle differences in these that I know of, and I can't exactly remember what they are. I have looked that up before and found that some of those wouldn't work. That leaves us with two um, options. Number one. We try to find a slightly bigger rubber and we bore this out to clean it up just a little bit. But this is 5 eighths, which is 0 0.625 millimeter, uh, 625, <laughs> 0.625 imperial rather. And, you know, I, I can't really figure out one that is, um, you know, that particular size as far as, you know, what that would be. And we can only go a little bit because remember this piston is, can't be all cattywampus in there. so. This is designed for the uh, major diameter of this piston and the rubber seal part, all right, the pressure seal. Yeah, now maybe I could find a better one of these that just spread, spreads out a little bit better, I don't know. Um, this one seems to be pretty good as far as the size goes. I think it would be working fine if it didn't have these um, problems in the bore. So the final option that I can think of because this is not gonna work anyway, we can't leave this thing dripping, is to bore this out, that, that uh, 5 eighths diameter in there, and I mean bore it out all the way down to the bottom, if we can reach that far, and then sleeve this with an aluminum sleeve. So what we'd end up doing is, is take, and I don't even know I can fixture this to do this, but you know, I'm, I'm kinda spitballing here right now, but the, you can see the major diameter of the smaller area. If we bored that out to the larger area, you know, this area out here, whatever that is, and then made a sleeve that had the right 5 8 ID, and then whatever that OD is, and then did a press fit, because that's a, that's a pretty good size wall right there, um, to be able to press fit that in. We, I would only use like maybe a thou crush or less, and then use like sleeve retainer on it, um, to hold it in place and it would also seal it off. Um, and then we wouldn't have to worry about the bottom, we would just have to bore it down to that bottom part. And then sleeve it, um, and then be done with it. And it would work. I'm, I'm certain that that would work. Now there's a lot of pressure that goes in that could potentially back out or underneath that sleeve if we didn't have a really good surface finish on the bore that we're going to bore out, and uh, thusly the um, sleeve that we're going to put in there. Oh, now the, the other, there is one other option I failed to, um, uh, to cover. We try to adapt a aftermarket um, to fit in here, and it has like a separate reservoir, but that's gonna take a lot of fabrication in itself. We're gonna fab, most likely fabricate some way to, for it to bolt up to here, because doubtful it's gonna match. Then we'd have to fabricate up something to hold the reservoir. Then we'd have to probably make a new rod for it to push it. So that, that would be, that would essentially be my plan B, I believe. If this fails, then I'm just going to try an aftermarket and, um, and then make it work. I think that's about the only option that we have. And I have seen a few on Z1 Enterprises and Dime City and so forth that might work. But again, going to have to do some fairly significant modifications to them, I believe, to make them work. But um, anyway, I'd rather try this first, try to keep it as original as possible with the you know, we, there's not a lot of real estate in here anyway with the original rear master cylinder. If I can get the reach with a boring bar in my boring head and I can get it fixtured, I believe I can run an indicator in and out of that far, far enough down to pick up square. And then um, I can just make sure we're concentric and then, dry, you know, then give it to beans, you know, send it home.
Now I know what you're going to say also because I would say it too. There's a cross hole in here. Now you can see the hole right there, you see it? And so uh, that hole we're going to need to drill through if we put, we put a sleeve in. So how are we going to get at that? So there's our little hole right there. So all we got to do is just run a drill through and we're done. And uh, we duplicate the same hole. Actually it kind of goes at this angle. You can see it kind of goes this way. So the hole is a little bit more toward this area, not straight in. So that's okay though. That's why they did it this way. So they have an access port. The main issue is going to be, of course, fixturing this thing. So uh, I'm going to go ahead and take the reservoir off. And then we'll think if we can do that. And I got to check my, um, I don't know if I have a boring head uh, or a boring head tool that will go down that far. That's the only other thing I'm a little concerned about. I may have to try making one if that's the case, but I don't even know if I can do that. So this is a bunch of ifs, but um, let's get to what we can do when we can figure that out. So stand by. All right, folks, here's the setup. I've got my angle block on, and this is clamped down. Unfortunately, it doesn't match up to the T-slots in the table exactly, but I do have one bolt going through and then just a strap over here, which is going to be fine. You don't need to tram this in because we're not worried about it this way. We're worried about it this way. And that's what we're going to measure here in a minute. The first thing we need to do is get this part trammed in this way, vertically. Okay, so we're going to tram it in both ways. We're going to make sure that um, on this plane and that plane, it's straight up and down by plunging down with the quill on the inside of the bore as far as we can. I'm just going to do a little tap a tap tap around and just have these guys clamped. Oh, by the way, I'm just using the mounting bosses. You haven't figured that out already. Where it mounts up. Those are machine surfaces. So when they made this, they probably used that as a as a reference or datum or whatever we're gonna call it. Don't marry him, datum. So what we're gonna do here is hopefully come in square up and down when we check this side. So that's why we want to get this one squared in first. So I'm hoping that uh, that'll just fall into place. I mean, when does that ever happen? Never. So that's what we're gonna do. So let me go get a tappy tap tap device. You know, I have a bronze or a brass hammer that went with the lathe and it has been MIA for months. I do not know where it went. See where we're at, go up and down. That ain't good. <laughs> All right, so if it's zero down in there and it's going plus up top, that means it's gotta be moved this way. I'll actually do it this way. I want to get, see the reason why it jumps up here is that's the bigger part of the bore. I want to get the narrower part of the bore. Let's do it this way. Here we're going minus, going down. So the bottom is moving away from that indicator. So we need to move it closer to the indicator. That's better. Ten thou minus. Yeah, the top is high, the bottom is low. So we're rolling up. If the movie is boring, then I am bored. Yeah, because if the top is high. Yes, get over bottom is low. I know it's not a whole lot of travel to test it, but, you know, it's all the travel we have. And there's some variances, variances inside that bore, too. Okay, so we're 90 degrees turned. So we're measuring it to see if it's uh, parallel with the angle plate. That's pretty damn good. So I was right. I figured they used those to, um, you know, machine it. They probably machined those first and then used those to fixture it. And then they bored it, probably on some sort of a horizontal boring machine or something. But that's pretty square. But we know this one's good, so I'm going to spin it back around off camera. We're going to double check, verify that this is okay. I probably should do the back too. I think I'll spin it around and check that one facing the other way. 
and then um, we'll tighten it all down, recheck it again, and then it'll be good because then we can pick up a center um, and uh, put the boring head in and then um, start cutting. We're good with concentricity. Isn't that a uh, police song or sting? So um, I wish I had a coaxial indicator. I've got to, I gotta buy one. It's be so much easier. You know, each one of these um, marks on there, all right, is a half a thou, all right, so, because it's a tens indicator. But, um, yeah, it is um, defi definitely, definitely, uh, really close. So I'm just going to bring you around here, show you. And uh, there is a backside. And over here. Doing pretty good as well. So yeah, we're good. I'm gonna go ahead and lock the table down and um, then we're gonna put the boring head in. We'll touch off and then uh, we, gotta, we gotta, well actually before that, we gotta set a Z with the DRO so we know how deep to go because you know we, we don't have a through bore. So we don't wanna crash into that either. Now we don't have power feed. I gotta manually feed it with the fine feed here, but either way, you know, we gotta do it. I may have to change the, uh, the pulleys around too because I'm not sure about the speed. I, I, I can't really read the speed. I don't have a way to do that But I can see it by eye how fast it needs to go basically basically so I'm gonna uh, Put the boring head in spin it around see how it looks But um, let me lock the table first and then we'll do that. All right, so I did a test cut See down inside there it actually looks pretty good Now the nice thing about these boring heads are and, and I do have a considerable amount of stick out but there's no flats on the tool bit in the back here where it goes into the, um, the head itself. And what I mean by that is here's one here that obviously isn't mounted in a tool head. But there's no flats in it. So what you can do is you can set this up um, and clock it, changing the geometry of the rake, whether you want positive or negative rake, or more positive or more negative rake. These things have some negative, uh, positive rake ground into them for, for relief on both, ax you know, both sides of it. Both, both angles, I should say. So what I did was I clocked her a little bit more so we got a little bit more positive rake uh, on the cutting edge and um, that seemed to be working pretty good. So I'm gonna leave the speed where it's at here. I think that's gonna be a pretty good speed. And I've already reset the zero because I moved this around obviously, I rotated it so I did change the zero. So I set it to zero. I know where the bottom of that tool is gonna hit the bottom of that bore by the DRO up here on the quill. So I think we're ready to start making some cuts. And uh, we'll go ahead and uh, do that, probably do some sort of a time warp. Good surface finish, you see a nice reflection on it. Now the size doesn't matter. Does size count at all? I like them when they're really big. And I think it's better when they're enormous. Because we're just gonna size the piece that's gonna be the new sleeve to whatever I cut it to. I didn't wanna go all the way down to lose the witness mark because I didn't measure the depth, it really didn't matter. As long as I have an edge in there, I can see how deep this needs to go and I know I'm all the way at the floor or at the end of that bore. So now we just have to set up and do that part. Good. So the ID has got to be at uh, 625 or 58 and we're really close. The tubing was just a little bit smaller than that. So I'm just taking some skim cuts and we'll get it out to that um, dimension. All right, the ID is done. It's about 3 thou over 58 and I did that on purpose because I changed my mind on how I'm going to install this. A very thin walled aluminum into something like this over that length, which is about 70 mil, because that starts actually down inside there. It, uh, it, it'll, it'll buckle, it'll deform. So what I'm going to do instead is I'm going to bring this to about two and a half thou over, and then I'm going to heat this up, like out in the outside grill, kind of like <laughs> Alan Milliard does, and we'll take the paint off at first. And then what I'll do is I'll put this in the freezer and then we'll do an app in a, you know, a regular expanding crush. So we should be able to just shove it in, 
bottom it out. We'll already have it cut the length so it sits exactly where it's supposed to. And then that'll reduce the ID a little bit. So as long as it's a couple thou within the 5 eighths, I think we're going to be fine. Uh, and uh, I think that's good. So the surface finish in there is excellent. I did my redneck, um, <laughs> redneck honing. I think it'll work out good, but we're just going to have to change the methodology a little bit. And I just need to bring the, uh, the uh, OD now down to uh, size. All right, here's the finished sleeve. The end that's chamfered more significantly than the other it goes in. I wanted to leave that outer edge kind of square like the original one was, more of a sharper edge. Whoops, it goes in this way. I think we'll have the good, a good amount of crush on it. Like I said, I'm going to strip this off camera, do all that off camera. I'll make some sort of a tool or find something just in case I got to drift it in like the last bit kind of make sure that it seats all the way and uh, then at that point just let it warm up and then we have to shoot one hole in here and then one hole in here which is right down the very bottom of it. I don't think we'll have any problem with it like I said I don't see any way of fluid getting around it uh, with that kind of a press and uh, it's going to be a lot easier or on, on the sleeve at least um, than trying to use uh, you know sleeve retainer. I think a couple thou crush is going to is going to hold it just fine. If it doesn't, we'll, we'll get another one. But this one, you know, we, we couldn't use it. It was pretty much scrap. So figured I'd try it at least. One minute, 37 seconds later. I changed my mind. You will change your mind. I changed my mind. You will change your mind. And I'm probably going to regret this. That's my credo. No regrets. Mm -hmm. You have no regrets? I think this is the best way to go, ultimately. Unless it doesn't work. Then you'll see it uh, in real time. But hey, you know what? Gotta try something. And uh, this is what we're gonna try. <laughs> so we go down further. There it goes. She needed to go a little bit more. See if we can make it go the rest of the way. I don't know, though, it may be too late. Yep. You know, that's it. It's as close as it's gonna, or far as it's gonna go, rather. Well, I guess it'll have to work or it don't. All right, here's why I did what I did. Um, I, I was having a real hard time measuring this ID. Just so happened that that finished bore size was kind of in between two of my spring gauges. One was a little bit better, so set it up as a no-go and was going inside, in and out of the bore. And not the bore of the sleeve, but the bore of the actual, uh, you know, master cylinder that I cut on the mill with the boring head. And turns out, it looks like it was too close to the finished size to really do that kind of heat and shrink type thing. I was shooting for about two and a half thou and I maybe had one to one and a half. So I said, well, that's not good enough. So I cleaned the snot out of this thing. And as you saw, I pressed it in with some sleeve retainer, which was my original intention anyway, to get that sleeve retainer in there to help bond this and seal it off. Because this sucker will, won't go anywhere. As long as it's good prep work, and you use the sleeve retainer as um, prescribed or designed, this thing is gonna be a permanent fix. So I'll show you a clip here of the, the extra long dangly bit that I have. And I think it's better when they're enormous. Down deep inside, the reason why I re-pushed it twice is it didn't look like it was seated all the way on the bottom. You'll see there's a little chatter in there, in fact, from where the boring head touched. But that was an optical delusion because of the uh, sleeve retainer it was pushed down there and made it look like a little space. So I wiped it all out real good with a paper towel with a dab of brake clean on it, screwdriver, and went down there and twisted it around. And as you can see from that clip, um, that is definitely seated. Definitely. Now I measured that depth from the old um, step, the remaining part of it, or I should say the shoulder of the old bore, and uh, made this sleeve the exact same size. And there's a chamfer on the end of this um, sleeve, not only to make it start, but to give any clearance 
because uh, normally if I was doing this with a boring tool on the lathe, I'd go inside and at the very end of the bore when I faced off that face, I would um, go a little bit further in and cut a relief. So if you're sleeving something, there'll be no chance of that sharp edge of the, of the, uh, of the sleeve not getting down all the way it's where it's supposed to be. That's why I put a chamfer there as well. So yeah, it looks good as you can see from that footage. Um, and it should be down all the way here. And the inside of the, of the sleeve looks really good as far as the size goes. I'm pretty sure at least because I, and naturally when you crush them, they're going to go down a little bit. But I made that big. It's supposed to be 625, I made it like 628. So it should have crushed it down to where it's supposed to be. So what we're going to do here is let's do kind of a dry assembly. Uh, you know, I hate it when I do it dry. But, you know, the thing is, we're going to do a dry assembly here of the parts, which we're well, not really totally dry. We're going to use um, a wee bit of the uh, brake uh, grease, the silicone grease, and then we'll make sure it actually goes back together. So anyway, that's it. Let me try it out here and see what happens. Probably won't work. I've had a lot of fails lately, as you guys have seen, but you know, I'm working with, you know, I'm working with crap that is just, it's just crap. And, you know, it's, I think that goes that way, yeah. Normally they go like that. Yeah, it goes like this. Yes. All right, so let's put that in correctly. Sometimes there's a little tang on the end of these things to keep them from coming off that little rubber piece, but this one doesn't have that. Uh-oh. <laughs> well, here's our first problem. Nope, <laughs> she don't fit. God dang it. What the heck happened? I, I made it big for crying out loud. And that's five eighths. So why that doesn't fit, I'm not really sure. Maybe it's five eighths is not a true five eighths. I don't know. Let's go down a little deeper in it and see. It's always good when it's deeper. You know, it's, I'm, I wouldn't be surprised there's a little taper in that bore, but you know, the seal is gonna compensate for that, so. No, that's actually bigger, 627. So this should fit. Maybe there's some damage to this. So I'm gonna go over to the lathe and uh, modify this. That's why you need a lathe. Gonna make shit work. Uh, okay, final try. And if this doesn't work, we're gonna have to go to plan B, which is an aftermarket and try to get it to work. But I said the, the main thing is the seal has got to be the right size and that is definitely definitely proud diameter wise of that and yeah so you can definitely feel that the, the rubber has got some drag in there. I mean you don't want too much but you know the reason why it's cup shape cupped shape rather outwards is so when it pressure when it builds pressure from in front of this it spreads it out spread out so that's why it does that. And I don't think I need to reassemble it all the way because I definitely have clearance here. Now, how far it's clearing before it bottoms? Because it's going to bottom on, um, going to bottom on this edge uh, before it hits the bottom. And if that sleeve is a little bit toward the top here, it may be off a little bit. I don't, I don't know. I'm gonna have to try it. I think I'm gonna do the hole, drill the holes, take that rubber part out inside there, drill the holes, clean them all up, clean this up again. And I think I'm going to reassemble it on the bike. I, I think it'd be stupid to uh, not do that. And uh, see if we can get it to bleed up and see if it works. Let's go ahead and try that. Yeah, look what I'm doing. Yeah, I had to set all this back up again and then plunge down in there, as you can see. And you can see it now it's blended. Remember there was a line around it. You could actually see a line of delineation from that sharp edge where it really shouldn't have been that pronounced. And that's because, guess what? The footage I showed you of the dangly bit down in there, and I said it was an optical illusion looking in there before without wiping the, the uh, you know, Loctite out. Well, that was an optical delusion because this thing was definitely, definitely not seated. No shit. And I'll show you why when I get it unfixtured here, how I 100% uh, realized that. And luckily I didn't um, do anything else before then. I've already drilled the cross holes because couldn't push this down anymore. But I'll show you definitively how I could tell this was not down all the way. But since I'm all blended up in here now, 
I know that I'm pretty much at that same length uh, level of that shoulder. So this is where we're going to leave it. I think it'll be perfectly fine once I deburr it. This is the banjo hole. That edge you can see down in there is the edge of the sleeve. That should be all the way to the top, and it's not. So something was holding it up. When I saw that, I said, I got I to gotta redo that. So we've got that nice and deep now. I think it's about the same. I still got to clean the bore out again. Uh, how I'll correct this is you can see that hole in the center of it is a little narrower than the thread area. I'll pick up a number drill size and go in there and just clean that out, essentially radius that to bring it back to where it's supposed to be. Then re-clean all this, then we'll reassemble it, put it on the bike and see how it works. Okay folks, next day, let that uh, sleeve retainer cure up. And uh, we're going to go ahead and test this out. I'm going to have to bleed this master first, so that's why I got this guy stuffed with a rag. After we bleed the master, um, we can um, pump it up. Pump your... Got a fresh bottle of, uh, you know, 130 proof. Now, usually I can tell pretty quick, just from experience, whether or not the master is going to be any good, how it bleeds up. It doesn't look terribly promising. Well, we're not getting any bleeding, so I must have done something wrong here. No shit. Yeah, I know. The observant among you will note that I reassembled the master cylinder incorrectly with that uh, cup seal. I don't know. My brain ain't 100% right yet. But no excuse. Let's take two. Try this again. The way that fluid was going up and down, up and down, and not going through where it's supposed to be. Should have kind of realized that immediately, but of course I didn't because I'm stupid. So, hey, you know what? It works. It works for me. You got to own something in your life. You might as well own stupidity, right? All right, so let's try this. That looks better. Oh, yeah. See, we're getting some bleeding right there. That's really good. When they bleed up quick, usually a really good sign. A lot of times you can flick these. You know, I do it on the handlebar ones as well. And there's a little air up in here. It'll work its way up, get out for you. But, and it is, it's building up again now. I'll bleed it another a little later. Main point is I want to build pressure in the body of the master cylinder. And then we're going to let it sit and see how it works. But yeah, we got good pressure. I mean, a good, you know, a good pedal, pedal, if you will. Feels good. Is good. We'll see. That's why I left the um, cap off. And of course, this is coming off of paint as well. But I left the cap off because I want to see this thing if it's dripping. So I'm going to have to leave it a day or two. I got some other things to do on this anyway which is why it's up on its side, on its side stand. Because I'm chasing down, guess what? Oil leaks. Let me go out to my truck and get my surprise look. Yeah, we're chasing down more oil leaks. One from here, which really wasn't from there. And uh, one on the stator side, even though I've put a, uh, well, generator side or dynamo side, how Kawasaki calls it. Even though I put a new gasket over on that side when I fixed that, problem with the loose bolt on the rotor way way back because I had one in stock it's aftermarket and it's leaking so I've got an OEM uh, um, dynamo cover and an OEM um, right crankcase cover coming I'll explain that here in a second but anyway the, the thing is generating some good pressure definitely need definitely definitely need to bleed it but um, you know the entire thing but like I said for now we're just gonna give it some wraps I can tell there's some air in there still, probably a little right up in there. All right, so um, so far so good, except for, duh, you know, putting the damn thing together wrong. Like I said, if you were watching it carefully on earlier clips, you saw that some idiot put the master cylinder back together incorrectly. I wonder who that was. Anybody home? Hi! One minute, 37 seconds later. I went ahead and bled the caliper, got some little bit of air bubbles out of it. It's definitely harder. Definitely. It's always good to be hard, but... Um, yeah, so this really needs to be about there and then start putting brake pressure on and that's controlled by the stop right here Now that is the bolt that Kawasaki specs for this 
but um, it's not long enough so when I pull this back off and I can push this down and get a lot more clearance in here I'm going to go ahead and replace that with a longer one so we can use the lock nut that'll bring this down to about right there and then we can adjust the uh, the, the shaft up proper play so I, I never was terribly happy about that anyway so uh, I'm just kind of working the details out as we go along. But then when something more important comes up, like the damn thing leaking um, or dripping all over the floor, then of course, um, you know, we got to deal with that. So hopefully that takes care of this. So yeah, we got a good solid break here. Just a lot of play in it right now because of the way I have it adjusted. So, well, I'll fix that later on. But this, like I said, this has got to all come off anyway and be repainted for the fifth time and hopefully the last, and uh, then, um, you know, it'll, it'll be done. But I'm going to let it sit a day or two just like this while I do the other things. And I'll tell you what that is here real quick. Like I said, I have this taped off. What happened was um, there was an oil leak coming from right here, which I assumed was this cover because the gasket didn't seem to be seated properly on the bottom in particular. And it wasn't loose. You know, the uh, M6 bolts weren't loose. You know, these kind, these cap bolts. Uh, but um, it was still leaking. Now, I originally thought it was the clutch cover because it was dripping down here, this being the lowest point. What was end ending up happening was oil was coming down, maybe when you're riding it and blowing it backwards, uh, and dripping down here. So I looked at this a number of times and decided that it was most likely this cover. So I put it over on its left side and, uh, you know, decided to pull this off, which I did. Naturally, I trashed the gasket. It was stuck on there like a long-lost relative. I decided to uh, just replace it with OEM. Meanwhile, I'm still trying to figure out where the leak came from because it didn't seem to be uh, on this uh, gasket surface. Then I looked down in here in these two main bolts for the engine case. I grabbed one and I could wiggle it back and forth. Both of them actually. These two bolts were loose. No shit. They weren't tight. The other two on the other side that you can get at are tight. So that's where the oil was coming from. I just couldn't tell with this cover on it. You know, I just, I just couldn't tell with this cover in place, you know, what, what, where the oil was coming from. So uh, that, it was dripping from here. So I've already retorqued these. I'll check them once more. Uh, I should have the gaskets in today. We'll put this all back together. Um, and then uh, at that point we can set it upright and I want to get back on the swing arm, but it's just some of these things that uh, occur when you're in the midst of trying to do one um, operation on one part of the bike and now we have to stop that because I got to lean it over I don't want to drain the oil out of it and replace the oil for that you know when I can just lean it over and do that so that is the reason why it is thusly thus all right that's what uh, that's the way it is so that um, pretty much concludes this one yeah successful except for the idiot that put the master cylinder back together incorrectly wonder who that was like I said well, I'll report back to you on another video in the future on this bike or another one if this is ultimately successful. Meanwhile, I can get this one um, edited and uh, encoded, fancy word, in uh, Premiere Pro. And then uh, we'll get it up on a channel and schedule for release. But, you know, you know, there's a lot of stuff you have to do on these old bikes, as you well know, from watching my channel in particular, that requires some, uh, you know, machining, some creative thinking, and just some, uh, you know, ingenuity, I guess. Ingenuity, not ingenuity. And, you know, that's what happens when you deal with these old, especially the rarer ones. Now, that brings up a point of liability, because naturally I have messed with a brake system and uh, changed the, the brake system uh, substantially by, you know, machining it and putting a sleeve in, which the manufacturers, Tomoko or Tomiko, whoever makes the, I can't, I don't know the pronunciation of that, never designed. But um, I know this owner and I know what he likes and I know that he uh, is okay with something like this because um, his motto to me is usually make it work. So we're, we made it work. And I just couldn't figure out another way to do this. And it's essentially an unreplaceable part. I mean, you can find them but they wouldn't be necessarily in any better shape. And even the ones that are in crap shape on the, on the, uh, uh, the eBay, all right, I almost said YouTube, on the eBay um, are um, like $179 for a junk one. There's one for like 90 something bucks plus shipping and it, it really looked like it come out of the bottom of the ocean. So, 
you know, the, when you have these parts that are super hard to replace, if not unobtainium, then this close to unobtainium, sometimes you got to do these kind of things. You just got to let the owner know that the brake's been modified and he's got to accept a liability, not liability, but, a, a, you know, responsibility for that and an understanding at least that um, if he's going down the road and the rear brake fails, then, which I really doubt, um, you know, uh, is it my fault? No, I tried the best I could to fix it and it was pretty much the only way to fix it. But, you know, there is some liability when you mess around with um, safety systems like this. But again, it's an antique bike, uh, it's uh, rare, and sometimes you gotta do what you gotta do. So if you like what you saw, you know what you need to do. You need to subscribe, ring the bell, and, uh, you know, do the other stuff like like this video. Uh, it really helps me out a lot. Doesn't cost you a cent, I swear to God. And then uh, you get notified when I put more crap like this up. So uh, I guess it's time to part ways in, from this video. I'm sure that you're breathing a sigh of relief right now. Thanks for watching, and we'll catch you on that next video.